Our fifth question concerns the viability of congregations. Our synod includes a number of congregations that are struggling to stay viable, both financially, just to keep their doors open, and also the people's energy and resources to carry out ministry. How will you guide these congregations as they consider their future? Pastor Felix will respond first. Um, well, I guess I want to say a few things. Um, first, I'll say that there's, right, as pastor of the synod, there's that pastoral response, just as I respond to any person who's going through the difficulty of facing the reality of life, whether um, it's short-term or long-term disabilities, or whether you're facing death. Um, you walk alongside people in that journey with them. You listen to their stories. You listen to their joys. You listen to their sorrows. And you don't try to sugarcoat it because all of it is real and all of it is necessary. Just like in the Psalms, there's Psalms that are full of glory. There are Psalms that are just lament. And that is necessary. But in the midst of all of that, um, it's helpful to name that God is with you in and through all of those experiences, right? Um, the other thing I'll say, and I think I said this before too, we need to expand our imagination a little bit in how it is that we do church. Because I think for a long time, um, there's really only been maybe two responses to what's a church that's struggling, it's about to close, um, doesn't know where to head to next. Either one, um, you try to cobble together as many small struggling churches as you can so they can maybe support one pastor who gets overworked. And that's a tough ministry for anyone who's done it. Um, and it generally doesn't lead to extra life. It just prolongs the death. Um, and so I, I think that needs to be reimagined. Um, or the other option is you close the church or, and maybe you redevelop, right? You close down the church and you maybe are born as something new in its place. And I think that's maybe something I could bring, um, some new imagination about what is possible. I'll give a couple for instances. Um, so for instance, I don't think, at least not in my knowledge, there's not too many um, ELCA congregations that have tried, instead of becoming, you know, two-point parishes, uh, to become a multi-site congregation, right? So instead of joining together two already struggling ministries, why not take a ministry that's thriving, that does have capacity, that does have resources, and make that a purposeful relationship with a congregation that's struggling, right? Instead of um, trying to put two that are already on their way down and out, try to make it limp along as long as possible. Take something that's already alive and thriving, join it together with one that needs a little bit help. And maybe you could say, all right, there's that big church that's in town, they're doing great. And now they have a satellite ministry that's in the country. They can continue to serve those people. They can help each other. It makes it more financially stable. Um, you can use more creativity. Um, you can do things together. You can begin to expand ministry of thinking instead of just, we are are our own congregation. You say, hey, we are the Lutheran church in this area, in this town, right? We are the Lutheran church presence, not just out in the country, but also um, in the city too, and do this ministry together. Um, another for instance, right? Because I don't know, I, I don't know if that would work or not. I can't promise I have answers, right? I just, I'm one who loves ideas and I love to dream and I, I can always come up with more. Um, and so I think another thing that could be invested in especially as some congregations are closing and maybe those buildings get sold, um, that there's a capacity to create more endowed pastoral chairs. Again, not something that many Lutheran um, uh, churches have invested in, but there is a reality, right, that as we look ahead to the future of the church, the future generations are probably not going to give monetarily the same way the past ones have. So to start to develop some really good endowments that can support the ministry of pastors for the longevity and the future of the church, I think would be a great idea. The synod could be the beginning of that. You know, even to say, what would it mean to do, like, I become bishop, let's do a six-year campaign. Um, make $2 million, $3 million, and you could pay a bishop forever. Take $100,000 off of the budget of any church or the synod, and you're able to say, now we know that this person is going to be here to do ministry in this community 
forever and you don't have to worry about the finances. Why aren't we thinking that way yet? I think there's just a lot of things we haven't thought of. And we've been stuck in some old models uh, because instead of leading, we've been responding. And I think it's time for the church to start leading on this edge rather than just responding to the current issues. Thank you. Pastor Anna. Thank you. Um, I think that this question about um, viability of finances and energy and time um, gets at that deep anxiety that many, many in the church have about, uh, will we be here? So my first word is a pastoral response. The church of Jesus Christ will continue. Um, congregations may or may not. Synods may or may not. Uh, things as we know them may or may not, but all of these are human structures um, that support the church of Jesus Christ. Um, are we going to be viable? Um, what does vi I think, what does viable mean? If it means, are we going to have enough money and people to maintain, maintain the status quo? Not likely in all places. Um, if, if in order to consider ourselves viable, we have to have a full-time pastor in every pulpit, every single Sunday, Maybe not. If we have to have a building or two for every single congregation and every congregation has to be financially independent and all of their ministry comes from comes to the offering plate, not necessarily. Um, but I do agree with uh, Pastor Felix that we have to expand our imagination about what ministry is and what ministry is possible. Um, we can also look backwards. In the La Crosse Area Synod, many of our congregations used to be sponsored by their neighboring churches. Um, a lot of them are mission starts of the ones that are older. Um, even in the congregation where I serve, our living memory is that we are a big congregation with one pastor all to ourselves but that's 160 years of church and only 60 of it has been with a single pastor. The 100 years before that was shared um, with a pastor who wasn't there every single Sunday. So some of it is, we don't even have to imagine a new thing. We have a thing. It's worked in the past and it can be reworked um, for the needs of today. Um, I think the other thing to say is that um, People have life cycles and congregations have life cycles and it's okay to be a small congregation without a lot of energy. If that's who you are and who God calls you to be, there's still good ministry to be done. We just have to figure out how to support it and do it well. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Becky Swan. Yeah, this is one of the pieces um, where the bishop's office in, as I pray about this, um, where it will be hard. I think it will be hard. Um, there's this dance that we have in our church between the independence that we've talked about, the independence of the congregations, um, and yet at the same time wanting this, you know, wanting the synod to do for us. Um, and I think the questions are more important than the answers as we approach these things. Um, I, I want to echo what my colleagues have said already and that the Holy Spirit is sustaining the church, but that it will look different and may not look or, or be in the same buildings that we know it now. A lot of um, our whole economy, not just the church's economy, but our whole economy is changing. Um, many people are more familiar now with what's been called the gig economy. Um, and people in our congregations are being affected by that, having to cobble together, right, 
um, a living wage. And too often, um, I hear the bivocational call from people who have not experienced the difficulty of that, um, you know, and, and have not lived that because there is a, there's a cost both to the rostered minister and to the congregation about that, that I think that the bishop and the synod office is called to walk alongside and to and to help with that conversation. But I think that there are ways, as Phil, as Pastor Felix was saying, to be creative and to and to look for more more ways than perhaps we know about how can how can a congregation understand their life together differently? How can a rostered minister, how can the synod come alongside someone who is being called by the spirit but may not have come through um, a formation process that we recognize yet? What is, what is the synod's role? What is the bishop's role in equipping baptized members uh, and and accompanying leaders in these con in congregations for leadership and um, and ministry that is beyond what they have imagined so far. My time's up. Thank you, Pastor Becky. So I see this question: How do you guide congregations as they consider this future? as a balance between care of the people and a balance between naming the truth of the experience of the church structure and whether it is uh, needs to change or not. It's do you accompany someone, a congregation through a process of dreaming or is it accompanying them through a process of grieving? Uh, there is a grieving process when you're going to say goodbye to something that you've held on to like a congregation and yet God's work will still continue. And so it's naming that. Uh, I do as well think that it's not just viability, but it's vitality. Is there vitality? Is there renewal in the, those congregations and in those places? And in South Dakota Synod where I've served, I've served a three point rural parish, uh, walked them through the process of how do we be, uh, renewed in a place where it's not like the numbers are going to grow. And so it's not about that. What is it about? I've been in a place where it's a small uh, rural church with a lot of growth happening around it and trying to decide who are we and what is are we called to be. And then where I'm at now is a large congregation. How can we, with our resources, be a partner for someone else? Exactly what Felix is talking about. They those models are out there. We're in the midst of that. There's finances available. There's models available through the anchor church movement as one way of experiencing that, of having congregation partner with another congregation and, and making things happen so that it is about renewal. It is about lifting up the uniqueness of congregations and where they are. It is about sometimes the grieving process of looking very different. It might not be that structure that they thought they would be, but when you are open to that. So it's a lot of hard work. My husband will say, I say the same thing as you, but people listen to you because you say it in a nicer way. You're, you're caring and yet you're still telling the truth of it. Uh, so he's a pastor too. So, <laughs> so we get to you know do that. But I think there's I'm so excited about this question because I think it's not about um, about things falling away. It's I think it's about the regrowth of how things will be. And it's exciting to think of colleagues in various places in synods that can do that work together. Thank you. Esther May. So I too have spent my whole ministry uh, walking with congregations for whom this is on the forefront of their concerns and that they are often fearful of their congregation becoming um, 
unable to continue. How much longer can we continue in ministry? I've served a two point, which has its own challenges. Um, but the answer isn't always just adding to, it might be um, this two point has, has valid ministry. And especially in the last couple of years with floods and COVID have done some really good work. Um, but each congregation I have served has struggled with that. I currently serve a congregation that I would call vibrant, tiny congregation. It's not growing hugely, but it has enthusiasm and it has enthusiasm for the gospel. And I think that's part of the question to ask with this question, where is your energy and passion and what is behind some of the fear is the fear that the building's going to be gone because that is part of it is it fear that because the building's gone and we're not meeting every week um, we're not going to be able to maintain the connections we have with people but as some of you all already mentioned that's not the core question the question is about being the embodiment of christ in the world and to strengthen one another in faith and so considering the viability of our smaller congregations, I too would respond first pa um, pastorally, listening <laughs> and praying and encouraging because I think it was Pastor Anna that said, your personal congregation may die, but the church of Jesus Christ, I'm 100% confident will continue. And that is gospel. It's just gonna look different. I also would like to foster an opportunity and places and ways to be created. Our pastors are on the forefront of this issue. What do they already do well? What are their strengths? I think there is some opportunity here with pastors and laity to let our pastors do the things for which they are called and which they are enthused. And then to yoke or figure out creative ways to find other ways to outsource and do those other ministries collectively. To think about our ministry um, of community, somebody else lifted that up instead of as individual silos to see us more as part of the whole body working together. That we are building on our strengths, our stewardship of gifts of pastors and laity. Um, rather than just our own little congregation with its buildings and mi limited ministry that we can do so much more if we build on the gifts of one another. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Steve. Thank you. I think this is a, a question that the church has asked in some ways for a long time. I read recently and I'm trying to remember where it was uh, this question back in the 50s, wondering about these small churches and what's going to happen uh, to them. You've heard some very good answers from my colleagues and uh, some, some wonderful responses. I've been uh, noting some of the things they have said. And I think with any church, the question of viability is, is not so much the size or how many people are, are coming or what's in their offering plate. Um, it's, it's the ministry that is going on there. Are they about doing God's work? Are they doing what God has called them to do for who they are at this time in their life? Or... Are they holding on to things from the past, thinking we have to keep doing this because we can't be the ones who let this, whatever that this is, go uh, out of some fear? We need to remember in, in everything that, as you've heard from others, that, that God is in the resurrection business where it looks like there is death, God can bring new life. And where there is death, God brings new life. We do need some creativity and we need to use some imaginations for how that can happen. I don't have the answers for that, but I'm willing to walk alongside churches to try with you um, to, to try new things. And, and if we fail, we fail, but at least we tried. We tried to do something. 
remembering that it is not for the sake of keeping the building open or not for the sake of, of having this uh, building that's surrounded by our ancestors who are buried in the cemetery outside of it, to think that we failed them in some way, but it's for the sake of the gospel and for the good news. Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered, he shows up. And so uh, we do this work and, and we try to see what brings us life and what serves the gospel. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Libby. So my one of my uh, titles is Director for Evangelical Mission in the La Crosse Area Synod. And the viability, vitality, sustainability of congregations is a primary concern for me for the last 12 years in our synod. Um, I, I agree with everything everybody has said, um, and I'm not gonna reiterate it. Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about what I have found um, over the past 12 years. Um, what I have found is a really, a really deadly cocktail of avoidance and denial and pride when it comes to how we hang on to the things that we think give us worth. Um, and that that worth is determined by a set of values that are not biblical. They're determined by values that say bigger is better, that more is always desirable, um, and that, uh, and what I've learned in this past year, especially, uh, is that smaller was better. Um, churches that, that had fewer people had a lot more flexibility and agility when it came to how to manage uh, the realities of a pandemic and how to be responsive in their communities. Um, I've also found that churches who felt like they were going to be economically destitute by the end of the year were not. Um, generosity didn't go anywhere. Um, in fact, we're, uh, most of our congregations have come through this time either well or even a little better. Um, I am worried about a church that does not, uh, that does what our culture tends to do, which is, which is and I, this is a strong word, but criminalizes poverty, where we place the burden of, of um, injustice on those who are most affected by it negatively. So instead of, so we're asking small congregations to do all the heavy lifting about viability and sustainability, instead of asking why do we have congregations that are bloated with wealth and, and, and things without asking them to share that, that burden um, and, and consider how they are responsible for this whole system that we have. We can no longer be defined as a church or, or define ourselves as successful by whether or not we can afford a pastor by the world's standards. I want to be a part of creating a church that is more just and that is more biblically based when it comes to how we form communities, how we form faith, and how we take care of, of the most vulnerable in society. And congregational viability is a huge piece of, of how we do that. So. Thanks. Thank you.